webinar, Dashboard Technology, Friend or Foe, brought to you by the National Safety Council. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. We will conduct a question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during today's webinar via the chat box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. We hope you enjoy the program, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I'll now turn things over to Bridget. Good morning. Um, this is Bridget Ballack, um, the Public Relations Manager at National Safety Council, and I'm here with Deb Trombley, Senior Program Manager of Transportation Initiatives at, um, at National Safety Council. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce to you our first speaker, and then after I introduce you to, you to our first speaker, we'd like to run a poll regarding um, your employer cell phone policies. Um, and just fill that out as you see it, and then um, I will hand it over to our first speaker. And our first speaker is David Strayer, Professor of Cognition and Neuroscience at University of Utah. Professor Strayer's work examines how attention functions within multiple research domains from assessing the limits of human multitasking ability while performing complex tasks such as driving to studying how attentional capacities can be restored by interacting with nature. He and his team use converging methodologies in their lab to measure, measure changes in both attention and performance from uh, psychophysiological subjective ratings to primary and secondary task measures. So that is um, Dr. Strayer. And then we have a poll that we are sending out to you right now. So we'll give that just a second before I turn it over to, uh, to him to begin his presentation. We'll give you a few minutes to uh, click on which answer fits you, and then we will we'll share the results with all of you. We'll give it a couple more seconds. It looks like people are still people are still clicking. Okay, uh, we'll stop the poll now. It looks like most of you have your answers in, and you can see the results that about only about 22% don't yet have a, a workplace policy banning cell phone use while driving. Most of you that do have a policy ban, ban conversation of some kind, and about a third of you ban both handheld and hands-free devices. So thank you for thank you for um, for taking the poll, and that that helps us to know where you stand while we go through the rest of the presentations. So with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Strayer. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm here to, today to discuss why talking to your car drives you to distraction. <clears throat> and what I'm referring to is not somebody who's thought disordered and just talks to inanimate objects, uh, but rather the fact that the car, especially new cars, are equipped with all kinds of voice-based capabilities. You can use a voice to dial, interact with navigation systems, uh, control the climate in your car, uh, send text messages, uh, that plus all the electronic uh, screens and everything like that has just put too much distraction at the uh, at the fingertips of uh, of the driver. It's really, in some respects, becoming the wild west with respect to the things that are in the car. Um, and I want to start by saying that uh, um, distraction, you know, it's not new. It's been around since the beginning of the automobile. Uh, so you can see images here of crashes uh, where someone was distracted. And in fact, uh, the first two cars that were uh, uh, licensed on the roads in Ohio crashed into each other. So driving and distraction have been around since the beginning of, uh, of the, the vehicles and of, of driving. Um, what uh, really kind of started to happen in the 30s was technology in the form of radios and record players, believe it or not, uh, started to be put into cars, and that would be something that would entertain the driver. 
And there was concern, and in fact, uh, several states uh, considered legislation that would limit the use of the radio so the driver couldn't be distracted. And about half the people uh, surveyed in the 30s, early 30s, thought this would be a significant source of distraction. We know that now know that that's not uh, as great a concern. Uh, uh, they're, you know, the, listening to radio at normal volume just isn't that distracting. But um, what happened was the uh, phone came along, and the original phone was something that was wired to the wall, so you really couldn't get in the car and go anywhere. And so it really, we didn't realize what kind of trouble it would cause. Uh, in 1973, um, that changed when Martin Cooper, who's pictured here, invented the car phone. And you can see it's a big, heavy, heavy phone. It's in the car, designed to be in the car. And it's designed basically to allow the motorist to be able to communicate on their fly while they're actually driving. Um, no real concern at that point was given to distraction. It was just, this is a convenience feature, and let's put it in the vehicle. Um, and now um, that we have our modern age, uh, we have a smartphone. That smartphone, over 300 million subscribers have a uh, wireless smartphone of some type. Uh, it is basically, uh, with these new smartphones, a portal to the Internet, and anything you can do on the Internet, you can do on these smartphones. Um, and now that uh, the cars allow you to uh, pair it with Bluetooth, pretty much anything that you could do on your phone in one form or another you're able to do while you're driving. Again, this is really starting to become a problem where we're just putting a perfect storm of far too much technology and far too much type of technology that may be addicting right at the fingertips of the driver. And that uh, kind of is illustrated uh, in the next example of we're now seeing these voice-based systems that are paired with your phone connected to large graphical displays. This is actually the, uh, the Tesla, and so it has a 17-inch display with all kinds of information, some supporting the task of driving, but other things that just aren't, uh, they're not related to the task of driving. They're providing information, inter entertainment, uh, letting people surf the Internet, uh, in some instances, some of the manufacturers are allowing social media interactions so people can send Facebook uh, posts and they can you know, do, interact on in, in social media. They can, they can um, send and receive text messages. Uh, some of the displays have heads up uh, information that projects to the windshield so that you can do a FaceTime video of your, with your mother as you're driving down the road. Uh, others have gesture-based controls. There's kind of an explosion of technology. Uh, we're putting a lot of uh, electronics in front of the driver, and a lot of that technology really is not supporting the task of driving. And we've known that's not been a good idea for a long time. Uh, this is actually a quote from Albert Einstein uh, that kind of exemplifies this issue and we, that we've known for a long time. Any man who can drive safely while kissing a pretty girl is simply not giving the kiss the attention it deserves. Um, and we actually uh, know there's a simple law that uh, comes out of cognitive neuroscience, my area of specialization, that talks about how humans can multitask. And we just are not really, really good at trying to do two things at once at the same time if they both demand attention. And so the, the aspects of interacting with your car, to talk to it, to dial, to do all the technology-based functions that your phone uh, provides oftentimes conflict directly with the ability to be able to drive safely. Um, so when we think about uh, distraction, we think about it in terms of three sources. We think about uh, this degree to which you may actually, uh, the visual, you have basically visual, visual, manual, and cognitive source of distraction. And the visual is when you take your eyes off the road. We know that if you take your eyes off the road to look at a text or to reach for something in the car, that after about two and a half seconds, the crash risk uh, significantly goes up. So a driver does have to keep their eyes on the road, uh, and they also have to keep their hands on the wheel. That visual manual uh, source of interaction is, is pretty obvious. You can see if you're driving down the road and someone's trying to send a text that they're swerving all over the place. They're stopped at green lights, and they don't and they don't go, or they, yeah, they stop at green lights and they don't actually, or they may run red lights, so they're just a, not an attentive driver. 
what happens with these voice-based technologies is they put uh, the voice base in so you can actually just use your voice with the assumption that I can keep my eyes on the road and my hands on the wheel. But it's not allowing the driver to keep their mind on the road. So they're actually, in situations like this, becoming cognitively distracted. We also know that not all forms of distraction are equal. So there are some aspects of distraction that are relatively low and don't cause a lot of problem. Listening to a radio, at least at normal volume, is an example of listening to something where uh, something is doing something in the vehicle that's not that cognitively distracting. We know that there are other kinds of activities that are more moderate in level of distraction. This is things like uh, talking on a cell phone. We know that talking on a cell phone significantly increases the source of distraction um, and increases the risks of a crash. Um, <clears throat> the concern is that uh, cell phones and talking on a cell phone was uh, uh, kind of a little bit older type of technology, believe it or not. And more people are now actually using their phones to text or to interact with social media. Or in some cases, they're, they're doing voice texting or things like this. And so what we're seeing is these new sources of distraction uh, are super high, far eclipsing uh, the talking on a cell phone uh, aspects of performance. So in conjunction with uh, work that we've been doing with uh, AAA, the Foundation for Traffic Safety, we set out to try and measure and benchmark exactly how distracting a variety of things were, starting with some of the older technologies, like listening to radio or talking on a cell phone, and then looking at more speech-based technologies, the kind of technology you might interact with if you buy a new car. And we developed a rating system that ranged from category one in terms of the workload of a driver who's doing nothing but driving, just the full task of driving, to our category five level of mental distraction where people are really, really having a difficult time concentrating on the road because the tasks they're trying to do at the same time is just too mentally demanding. And we have, I'm going to talk about briefly two, two studies, one looking at some of the older technologies, and then the next looking at uh, the second study I'll briefly review is one that uh, looks at the 2015 vehicles. If you bought a car in 2015, the technology that uh, we're looking at is is uh, kind of reviewed, at least in part, in that second uh, set of studies I'll show you. Um, but what we did in our first phase was we had eight different tasks people could do. They could drive, uh, so we have a um, single task driving where they could just do undistracted driving, and that's a category one level of workload. We also then had people drive while they were listening to the radio or drive while they're listening to book on tape or drive while they're talking to a passenger, or drive while they're talking on a handheld or hands-free cell phone. And then um, we also uh, developed a uh, system that would allow you to send and receive uh, emails or text, short little messages. Uh, it was a perfect system, though, so that the system was, uh, if you gave it some if you give it something that you wanted to send, there was no error in translation. We actually built one a system in the laboratory that we could control so that whatever you said was recorded faithfully. Uh, that's not the case with new technologies. In many cases, the, the personal assistants get the message incorrectly, um, transcribe that, transcribe that message incorrectly. And the last, our category five level of workload was something called the operations fan task. And it's a task that uh, no one in their right mind would do while they're driving. Um, it requires the driver to uh, solve math problems in their head while they're holding uh, other information in working memory, and then we test them for how well they can do those two tasks in combination while they're driving. Like I said, no one would think about doing that task um, while they're driving. It's kind of like balancing your checkbook while you're driving down the road. The reason that I kind of focus on this here is that was our, what we hoped would be our high water mark in terms of the most distracting thing we could think of. And I'll kind of just uh, foreshadow the uh, uh, work we're going to be showing you that some of the voice-based systems that allow you to send text messages that you may be using right now are equivalent in difficulty to this operation span task category five level of distraction. We integrated, and when we did the testing, we took some measures of how well people could drive. We used some probes of secondary tasks, how much attention was being used. Uh, we used the... Uh, we used the um, NASA task load index for subjective workload, and then we measured the brain activity and heart rate and a number of other physiological measures. We integrated all of these things into one common workload measure, and um, 
then we did it while people were um, oops, excuse me. We did it while people were either driving in a simulator in a kind of a safe environment. That's what you see on the left here is someone who's driving in our simulator. Or we had someone who's driving on the road. And most of our work now is done while people are actually driving on the road. And here you can see this participant were recording brain activity as she's driving down the highway or driving in, on the roadways. And we have people driving in a residential section, uh, about a three mile loop in a residential section. So it's real world driving with stop signs and so forth, uh, just like you may be driving if you're using this technology. Uh, and here's our workload scale for the eight things we tested to begin with. Uh, our single task is uh, our category one to the, uh, to the left here. So here's our single task, category one. Our operation span task, this is that category five memory math task, that's our category five. And then as we go to things like listening to the radio, you can see that the radio uh, does increase the workload a little bit, but just not that much. It's actually something that you can measure and you can see it's in the car, but it's just not something we would consider this to be a low level of, of increase in workload. The same thing with listening to a uh, book on tape. It increases it a little bit, but still you're well below two. And then if you look at things like talking to a passenger, that's where you're at, the dr pat driver's actually talking, uh, or they're talking on a handheld or a hands-free cell phone. Those three actually uh, turn out to be equivalent. It turns out actually that uh, when the driver is talking, whether they're talking to a passenger or on a handheld or hands-free cell phone, the workload's the same. One thing that differs between the cell phone conversation, though, and the uh, passenger conversation is that the passenger, if it's another adult, they can help the driver out. So they'll actually uh, stop talking or point out hazards. And so even though the workload that the driver is experiencing when they're talking is the same, the passenger compensates for that if they're in the vehicle. And so the overall risk for a passenger conversation, at least with another adult, uh, is much different than handheld and hands-free cell phones. And then using this voice-based speech-to-text system, this is a perfect one in the laboratory. That was where we saw really the highest level of workload for any kind of a real type system, which was uh, category three on our workload scale. So we're seeing some of the higher levels of workload with a perfect system that doesn't make any errors. Now if we look at uh, kind of look at this, there's a low level of workload for uh, things like book on tape and radio. There's a more of a moderate level of workload for conversations that people, the driver is holding either on the phone or with a passenger in the car. And in terms of the workload, the highest levels we were seeing, at least initially, were these speech-to-text systems that allowed the driver to talk to their car. Um, now the next phase we started to do was use this toolkit to we, where, where we developed the measures for workload and measured workload in 2015 vehicles. We tested 10 2015 vehicles that, with uh, the ob ability to be able to place calls, to change music, and to, um, uh, um, in, in the case where we're looking at uh, the uh, smartphones, to be able to send text messages. And when we do those in that analysis, um, we had, again, people driving in that same residential uh, section where they'd place a call, tune the radio, maybe dial and tune the radio. Um, and when they would do that and they would be in the active phase of actually, say, told, told to tune the radio, this little, p uh, this little kind of um, pink area here shows the period of time when they're actively talking to the car. And we refer to this as in IVIS, in-vehicle information system. They're actively talking. And then after they uh, have finished talking, there's a period of time when they've finished talking and they're, and they're just driving until they're told, okay, now you need to place a, uh, place a call, and that call might take uh, a, sh a little, little shorter period of time. So here's another period of time where people are talking to the car. And then if we look at the um, system here, here's a period of time when they're now just driving. And the question was, uh, how does when you're on, when you're actually talking to the car, how's it, how does it compare with if you're just driving alone? How do these washout intervals compare? And when we look at this, what we find is, and this is from this uh, one of the measures, the secondary task measures, it's an ISO standard for measuring distraction, that um, we, if we, sorry, if we go to um, our category one, that's the workload of a driver who is uh, just driving, that's our category one level of workload. If they're now trying to do that memory math task, 
That's our Category 5 high level. But watch what happens when people are talking to the car to change the radio or to, send a, uh, or to place a call. Their workload is very close to that Category 5 level. Talking to your car is not free, hands-free, simply isn't risk-free. And there's also, notice that there's kind of a residual uh, cost uh, here where you see actually these drivers in this off-task interval, they're no longer talking to the car, but they had been. And so this is that kind of hangover, the technology hangover of the fact that you have been talking to the car. And what you can see if you look is when people are actively talking to the car and then waiting, you see this on-off-task aspects of behavior. Uh, so you're seeing that when people are interacting with these systems that are put in cars that are designed to be totally hands-free and eyes on the road, they still have very big sources of distraction. We also see that this is this off-task interval, and so three seconds would be three seconds after the driver had finished talking to the car. Workload levels are still real high, and it takes up to 27 seconds for those distraction levels to fade back to single-task levels. So we're seeing that that technology hangover can persist for up to 27 seconds after the driver has stopped talking to their car. I know a lot of people think, I don't text while I'm driving. I, when I get to light, though, I'll send a quick text, and as light turns green, I'll go. But this technology hangover suggests that if you engage in that technology of trying to send a text message at the light, when that light turns green, you are not with your full attention back on the road, and you're going to suffer some of these residual costs like we're seeing here. Um, if we look at uh, this as surprisingly high levels, these residual cost levels last up to 27 seconds. It's a relatively large level of impairment. Um, and we also look across the age range. So we looked at people between the ages of 21 and 70. And what we see on the left here is the difference between a younger and older driver in terms of their reaction times when they're just driving in single task conditions. And these differences are more than doubled when drivers, uh, when, uh, drivers start to uh, interact with these voice-based systems. Older drivers are having a much greater time, difficulty talking and, and using their voice to command these systems. It's also interesting that the older drivers are, at least right now, most likely to be using this technology. Um, and if you look at smartphones, as I mentioned before, the smartphone allows you to pretty much have a portal to anything that the Internet will provide. We tested this in a variety of ways, but one of the things we did was we tested voice texting, where people would be able to send voice texts. And what you see here is um, this is our single task level of performance. Then we had our Category 5 operation span task when people were doing the memory math task. But then when we had people uh, doing the uh, voice texting, and this is that washout interval where they sent a text message and now they're just driving. We see there's residual costs that are uh, up to like a lasting uh, a fair amount of time when people are actually have sent a text message and now they're just trying to drive. Um, and then if you look at the intervals of time when people are actively talking to their phone to try and send a text message, that workload is the same as that Category 5. In fact, when people were using the Apple with Siri, it was actually a little bit higher than doing that memory math task uh, that no one in their right mind would do. So the technologies that are being supported in the car are at that really high level of workload. When we look at the the pattern overall, what we see is, and this is the uh, this is now the um, the ten vehicles that we tested, along with the smartphones that we tested, and you can see that some of them uh, on the left are actually uh, have a relative when you're using your voice to communicate with the car. Uh, to uh, send texts and do other things like that. The workload, uh, and in particular changing the radio and so forth, workload's relatively low in that moderate level. That's what we would see with the use of a hands-free uh, cell phone, about a 2.4. But to do the same exact activities, but with the Mazda, uh, the workload was a 4.6, almost twice the level of workload for precisely the same interaction. So I guess the message here is that just because the technologies are in your car doesn't mean it's easy to use, and even if it is relatively easier to use than the other vehicles, it still has a relatively high level of workload uh, in that moderate category. What we're seeing is that voice-based technologies are ranging from moderate to, uh, to uh, a very high level of distraction. So um, I guess the closing here is that uh, hands-free is not risk-free. We're putting a lot of technology at the fingertips of the driver. In many situations, those voice-based interactions have really high levels of workload. It takes a long time for it to fade. 
when we give people practice so they can have a week to practice with these systems, they just don't get much better. Everyone across the age range is having difficulties, but older drivers are really having some of the greatest difficulties. Um, and these systems that you can buy, they vary in quality, uh, they vary in levels of distraction. Some are very easy to use, but some of them are very complicated, frustrating, and takes you a long time to perform the tasks. And in many cases, they don't do what you want. So just because the system is in the car, doesn't necessarily mean that it's good to use while you're driving. Watch out, again, hands-free is not risk-free. And at that point, I'll uh, happy to kind of turn it over to the next part of this uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Strayer. Um, we are going to move on to our next presenter, um, Member Sumwalt. Uh, Robert Sumwalt is a member of the National Transportation Safety Board. He was appointed as the 37th member of the National Transportation Safety Board in August of 2006, whereupon, whereupon President George W. Bush designated him as Vice Chairman of the Board for a two-year term. In November 2011, President Barack Obama reappointed member Sumwalt to an additional five-year term as a board member. Since joining the board, member Sumwalt has been a fierce advocate for improving safety in all modes of transportation, including teen driver safety, impaired driving, distractions in transportation, and several rail safety initiatives. Um, and I'd like to welcome and turn over um, turn it over to Member Sumwalt. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. And uh, I'd like to thank the National Safety Council for uh, for hosting this webinar. We are delighted to. Uh, to be a part of it uh, at the uh, at the NTSB, and I guess I'm just waiting on my uh, slides to come up. Uh, I think I've uh, gotten control of this thing here, but uh, if we could get uh, my slides up. So, um, well, let's see. Anyway, um, there we are. So, of course, just by way of background, of course, most of you know the NTSB. We're uh, we're in the news a lot, uh, including this week. Uh, with a few a uh, few accidents, train wreck up in uh, by Philadelphia, but uh, but our mission primarily right here uh, to prevent accidents, reduce injuries, and save lives, and we do that by accident investigation. Um, you know, everybody knows the NTSB investigates train uh, or plane plane crashes, but of course we also investigate accidents in 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 other modes as well. Um, significantly, as it relates to this conversation, is that we don't investigate all highway crashes. In fact, we we only investigate, oh gosh, probably a half dozen a year. So, um, so that's the point I wanted to make there. Every year, we come out with the most wanted list of transportation safety improvements. And for the last number of years, uh, the the issue of disconnecting from deadly distractions has been featured prominently on our most wanted list. It's a, a list of 10, 10 areas where we feel significant improvements can be made to enhance transportation safety. Now, they're not rank ordered, but of course I did put disconnect from deadly distractions here top on the list uh, because it's one that uh, that I personally feel is a, is a real problem and one that uh, we need to get a handle on. Uh, so. Of course, as we know, distractions can can come in in any form. It can come in the form of eating a a hamburger while you're driving down the road. It can come in the form of a of a, of a rowdy set of kids in the back seat. Uh, but those, uh, you know, the rowdy kids uh, that can be somewhat controlled. But uh, the ones we really can make a decision whether or not we we want to use is the idea of these electronic devices. And um, I remember from a webinar we had two years ago, David Teeter, with the, uh, who was then with the uh, National Safety Council, said, you know, a lot of these other things, like crying babies in the back, um, that's just part of life. But, but so many of the things that we're, we're seeing here at the NTSB are not directly related to the driving task. So if we can put down these electronic devices, uh, I think we can in, in, increase safety. I thought that David's presentation was absolutely fascinating because it did present the science. And I really w will talk about not so much the science as I will some of the accidents that we've investigated. I will take um, exception to one thing David said, and, and he referred to basically I'm an older driver now, and I was disappointed to see that I was in that category, but I guess I can't avoid, uh, can't avoid that. 
last year to kick off um, to kick off Distracted Driving Awareness Month. Of course, that's April. Uh, on the 31st of March of last year, we held a multimodal roundtable discussion on on distractions. And this roundtable uh, it, it incorporated uh, representatives from all modes of transportation, because our goal is to ensure safe transportation for all travelers, regardless of the mode of transportation that they that they uh, elect to travel in. Uh, I was absolutely thrilled to be the uh, facilitator for the uh, for the roundtable. And we had a, a diverse group of, uh, of around 40 sa safety experts, uh, regulators, scientists, David Strayer was there, uh, researchers, advocates, engineers, insurance representatives, law enforcement uh, um, officials, and, and, and also victims of families, uh, people who have had loved ones uh, affected by, uh, by distractions in transportation. Um, one of the things I found was really fascinating, and I won't go through each of these tracks, but one of the things that was fascinating to me, and, and David used the word addictive, uh, 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 addictive. I was fascinated by a discussion that centered around this addictive nature of staying connected through our personal electronic devices. Uh, one of our panelists was Paul Atchley from uh, uh, the University of Kansas. And he said, there's nothing more interesting to the human brain than other people. And he explained that dopamine, uh, of course, most of us know that's dopamine is one of the brain's reward chemicals that produces positive feelings and sensations. And Dr. Ashley said, there's nothing more rewarding than the opportunity to talk to someone else. And, uh, and he said that because connecting with others produces a release of dopamine into the uh, brain's uh, midsection, it's very difficult for us to ignore the urge to connect with others. And I know that. I literally had to hide my phone before this webinar because I figured uh, somebody might be texting me at an inopportune time, and I would have the, ten the, the tendency to want to pick it up. Um, at the um, at the webinar, I'm sorry, at the roundtable, we also heard from um, Andrea Brown, uh, Andrea Brands of AT&T, and I want to mention that we're tweeting out a link to this um, to the transcript from the roundtable. It's 260 pages. Um, it's fascinating, and you might want to grab a copy of that transcript and just and just look through it. It's written like a. a um, like a, a deposition sort of format, so it's uh, double spaced and, and really pretty easy to read. It's written in a, you know, just an exact transcript of what was said. But Andrew Brands from A and T, AT and T, followed up um, on the point of about the addiction, um, um, and they they uh, they they conducted a, a, a survey um, at the uh, at AT and T through the Center of uh, Internet and Technology Addiction, and they found that that three quarters of the 1,000 people surveyed admitted to engaging in texting or checking social media while driving, and yet a large percentage of the survey respondents rationalized that behavior even though they knew it was dangerous, which is, according to Andrea Browns, a, a, a true sign of addictive behavior. Um, so I guess whether or not we call it addictive, compulsive or, or just a habit, the fact remains that while using a personal electronic device while operating any vehicle is dangerous business. Um, let me um, just talk to you about some of the things that we've looked at at the NTSB to sh sort of really drive home that point about how dangerous this can be. We investigated a, a helicopter crash a few years ago um, in, in Missouri. And uh, four fatalities, including the person that they were sent to uh, to save the life of. What was the pilot doing? Unbelievably, the pilot was texting uh, while flying, as well as texting while they were at a station to, at a hospital to pick up the patient. And 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 David talked about that uh, that um, the technology hangover. And so while this pilot is flying. Is it possible that not only was he texting, but he had the technology hangover that, that you know that he was thinking about what he was uh, um, texting while he was at the uh, hospital picking up someone? 
Uh, all of these are so tragic. This was uh, uh, a few years ago in Philadelphia. Uh, you see a duck boat. I think most of us uh, would realize a duck boat uh, is something that used to be used in World War II, and they're amphibious vehicles, and now they're used for, for tour uh, sort of things. They'll give you a tour around the city while they're in their in their land mode, and then they uh, go into their amphibious mode and, uh, and go into the... Uh, uh, into the water and give you a tour. And this duck boat was stranded in the water. The engine had uh, conked out. And um, uh, the this barge basically ran over the duck boat. Uh, uh, amazingly, eight, two peop only two people uh, died, but yet that was uh, very tragic in its own self, in its own right. The 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 pilot or the mast or the the mate that was pushing the barge from a tugboat was engaged in a cell phone conversation. Unfortunately, he had a, a family emergency uh, going on at home, and he was involved in that, and, and actually just not paying attention to, to uh, navigating his barge, and unfortunately, this occurred. I think most of us recognize this tragedy in uh, Chatsworth, California, the largest, one of the largest rail accidents in, in recent uh, history. Um, what was happening there, the engineer of the commuter train was texting and actually ran through a, uh, a red signal and collided head-on with a freight train, 25 fatalities. Munfordville, uh, Kentucky, 11 fatalities here where a, uh, an 18-wheeler crossed a median and struck a van carrying a family. Um, we found that the driver, from his driver's records, he was distracted from the driving task by the use of a cellular telephone at the time of the accident. And um, we, we pointed out in that accident report that changes in driving behavior occur when the cognitive distraction of a cellular telephone conversation diverts attention from driving. And we saw that very well in David's data. And we came out and said, therefore, the, the, the use of either a handheld or hands-free cellular telephone while driving can impair performance. A 19-year-old uh, uh, teenager was killed. Well, I guess that's redundant. A 19-year-old boy, was a young, young man, was, was killed uh, on this day, uh, August of 2010. He was texting. We, we found that uh, in the... Uh, well, here's the slide on that. He sent and received 11 text messages in the 11 minutes prior to the crash. And, and as we find in so many of these conversations, this is, these are not life or death conversations. Uh, a lot of these are just social in nature. We saw this in the Munfordville crash that the, uh, that the driver of the 18-wheeler was carrying on a conversation about plans for the upcoming weekend, uh, same as the helicopter pilot texting with somebody about dinner plans, same as the driver of this 19-year-old uh, this driver here. He was um, communicating with a friend about the plans, plans coming up for that night. Um, he, he ran into the back of the stopped Volvo. There were no skid marks whatsoever. Uh, ran into the back of the Volvo that was stopped for a, a road work at 55 miles an hour. No skid marks whatsoever, no braking effort. And then tragically, the bus, school bus behind it, behind the GMC pickup, ran into him. So it squashed his, uh, his uh, pickup to look unidentifiable, as you see here on the slide on the right. School bus ran into it, and then another school bus ran into the back of the first school bus, which claimed the life of a young girl sitting in the back of the school bus. So as we found, um, I had a victim of a, of a, of a, of a crash, highway crash, uh, a family member of a victim of a, a highway crash came up to me and said, you know, we talk about seatbelt usage. And for a seatbelt, if you're not wearing your seatbelt, you pretty much just endanger your own life. But when you're conducting, um, using uh, portable electronic devices such as texting or talking on the phone, you're not only endangering your own life, but you're endangering those who, who share the highway with you and even pedestrians. I've got a, uh, one of our great advocates uh, lost his daughter, a um, uh, daughter in her early 20s who was simply walking across the street one summer 
uh, going to the restaurant where she worked as a waitress over over over, um, over the summer break. She was a pedestrian. So you do endanger uh, the lives of others as well. What did we say? Well, in that accident report, crash report, we said the GMC pickup driver was most likely distracted from driving by texting conversation. And as a result of that crash, after seeing one after another after another, the NTSB came out and called for the, a ban on the non-emergency use of personal electronic devices for all drivers. And that means using them whether hands-free or hand-held. Because as David's data show and, and, and other data show, there's statistically no difference in the, um, in the amount of distraction from a handheld um, phone versus a hands-free phone. You know, the cognitive distraction, a lot of people don't believe that. Uh, it's real, and I think actually um, a really good paper on that is was done by the uh, National Safety Council. I refer to it uh, often. It does a nice job of explaining, in layman's terms, this cognitive distraction. Um, the fact is, is that overwhelming data show there's, as I said, mentioned, there's no significant difference in the crash risk. Um, um, you know, and, and I feel like, and this is a personal viewpoint here, but, but I think that laws and policies that only prohibit handheld devices are actually perpetuating this myth. And, and I think that they're sending the wrong message. They're sending the message that, that one is okay and the other is not. And, um, and, and, and that's, just, that's just wrong uh, from, a, from a data point of view. Let me, before I get into this slide here, um, I really want to talk to you just to show you um, um, about um, a highway crash that we saw a few years ago in 2013 um, out in Mount Vernon, Washington. Um, it was a, um, a, a bridge crossing the Skagit River on I-5 in Washington State. Um, we know how these um, wide loads, when they're going down the interstate, they have to have an escort vehicle, one in the front and one in the back. And the one in the front you know, has a big sign on it saying wide load. And then they, they'll have a, if it's over height, the height is excessive, they'll have a pole, a sort of a sensing pole, like whiskers on a on a cat, I guess, that if you you know, if your if your pole touches this top of this the bottom of the bridge, then then we know we're gonna not be able to fit the uh the, the wide load through. Well this woman was driving an escort vehicle and um uh, she uh, in the lead escort vehicle. She was having a, 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 a heated conversation with her husband about a, a load they were supposed to escort the next day. She was worried about the routing of it. And while going through this bridge, she did not even notice that her, her guide pole had struck the bridge, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, pillars in the top of the bridge, the, the structural members in the top of the bridge. Well, of course, the, uh, a few seconds behind that is the wide load. The wide load uh, struck the, uh, the support structure, uh, top support structure of the bridge. The entire bridge collapsed. Uh, an interstate bridge collapsed. Fortunately, no fatalities. There were cars that ended up in the water, but again, no, no fatalities. But what we did find from that, one of the findings from that was we talked about the cognitive distraction associated with using a, a, a wireless device in a, um, in a hands-free mode. I meant to have that slide in, and, um, and, and I don't. So it, it's a pretty vivid-looking uh, picture to see, uh, see this bridge that's collapsed. Now, on to this current one, this slide that's here. Same sort of a deal. The uh, top of this bridge, the top of this bus was uh, was sheared off. It was carrying a a group of uh, high school students down to George Washington's home at Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon, Virginia. That is, and as you're going down the uh, uh, George Washington Parkway, the bridges are nice and old, and they're beautiful and scenic looking, and they look like this. And you can you can see what's going to happen here. Obviously, the side on the right is uh, lower than the side on the on the left. Uh, there are signs there pointing that, but there are also advance signs uh, to indicate that uh, you know you've got limited clearance. The driver, uh, not only did he not see the signs but he did not see the bridge until after he struck it. What was he doing? 
Well, he was having a conversation with his sister over a hand-free device. So we've seen accidents, and we don't investigate all highway crashes. We've seen crashes where this cognitive distraction uh, from using a phone or texting, it's there, but the fact is this idea of hand-free being safer than handheld, that's a myth. And if anything else comes out of this webinar from my point of view, it would, I would want it to be that point. So this is what we found. So what's needed? We feel like there's really three a uh, three-legged stool. We need enforceable laws, good laws that are enforceable. We need high visibility enforcement of those laws, and we need to educate um, people that are operating vehicles that this is a serious problem and it needs to be taken seriously. Um, you know. Um, David mentioned that we need to keep our eyes on the road and our hands on the wheel. And he also made the point, and I think this is one that some people miss, is that we have to also keep our mind on the driving task. Um, you know, you don't really have to wait for laws to do the right thing for your organization. Um, in fact, the laws are going to be slow in coming if they come at all any time in the near future. So you can do the right thing by having policies and enforcing those policies. Um, and and uh, um, the, again, the National Safety Council has a good paper on the liability of organizations associated with, uh, with, with, with having employees that are talking on the phones and they have an accident and, uh, and they get sued. Uh, there's a lot of liability, a lot of exposure out there for organizations. Um, so these are some things that we need to do the right thing. And something that Adelaide Stevenson said is don't be afraid of unpopular positions of, of driving upstream. All progress has resulted from people who took unpopular positions. So let your moral compass drive you in the direction of doing the right thing. Uh, we've got a, a wealth of uh, folks at the NTSB that can help you. I have uh, two of them sitting in my office right now. Our safety advocate uh, division is, uh, is wonderful. It's led by Nicholas Worrell, and uh, he, he is, has a lot of energy, and uh, so does his staff. And so um, uh, you can reach out to Nicholas through, through this contact, or me personally. I'd be delighted to help you any way that we can. So I'll turn it back over uh, to you all for, for discussion. Thank you very much, Member Stumwalt. Um, we are going to, uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Deb Trombley, who wants to share a couple um, slides with you, and then we'll, we'll go right into Q&A. Yes, thank you. And I think the, the information Member Stumwalt and, and Dr. Strayer shared is, is really compelling. and. I just want to quickly share a few points with you, and then we'll, we'll go. We, you can tell it's compelling because we got a lot of really good, um, tough questions coming in to us. Um, but I think one important takeaway is the public doesn't know what we're talking about today. And so I think there's a message for all of us uh, on the call, particularly with this being Distracted Driving Awareness Month, to communicate this to people. The National Safety Council did a poll a, a couple years ago, and at that point, 80% of drivers believe hands-free devices are safer than handheld. And we just repeated the poll, and that number hasn't changed. So that's that's standing steady, and so we people need to hear these messages. And many drivers believe because these devices are provided to them into their vehicles that they must be safe for them to use. So we have a few resources. And in an email to all participants and people who haven't been able to attend today, we will also include links to these. But I, I wanted to call your attention that we do have materials for Distracted Driving Awareness Month. Our theme this year is Take Back Your Drive. And to describe where they came from, you know, we're barraged with communications all day, every day. And as Member Sumwalt said, you know, you feel compelled to respond to them. It's, it's a heavy load on us. 
our cars are one place where we can really take a break from that and let our cars be a safe sanctuary. So that's the theme this year. It's a little bit more of a positive approach and it's telling people, you know, this is the direction that, that you can go in. They'll help keep you safer. And I know many on the call are representing businesses. Many of you are occupational safety professionals. As Member Sumwalt recommended, we also recommend that employers pass policies that prohibit cell phone use while driving for, for work-related communications and driving. So we have a kit that can help you pass a policy. It has uh, all ready-made materials for you. And we also have a policy tool which is a, it's like a seven question two way survey and it's like a gap analysis. So what it will do, you answer the questions and it'll tell you where your policy is today and how that compares to the, our best practice policies and what you can do to, to improve your policy to meet best practice. So again, we'll send those to you in email. Um, I'll go into Q&A now and we have a lot of people asking if you'll get a copy of the slides or a recording afterwards, and yes, you will. We've recorded the webinar, and it, in the past we've made it available on YouTube. I think it will be on there again. Um, if it's not on YouTube, you will get a link in your email so you can, you can share the presentation. You can see the slides again if you'd like. Um, a few quick, easy questions. Someone asked, how many webinar participants are there? Because uh, for those of you who are at the beginning of the call, we ran a poll that asked how many, um, how many of you have company policies and what those policies cover. And there were about 330 people on the call today. So that, that puts those answers in perspective. So uh, there are a number of questions after Do Dr. Strayer wrote, and I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase them into one, and I, I hope this gets at what, you know, what you're all asking. They were asking about automaker response to the findings about the, um, the infotainment systems and, you know, what has the response been to that and is a solution to, you know, give drivers more options to lock out these features if they want or, you know, what what is happening with that. Um, do, would either of you like to speak to that? I mean, I can, I can briefly just say that <clears throat> when, uh, when we release the, the materials that we release uh, with AAA, we actually have outreach and meet with many of the OEMs. I think that the, the general sentiment is that they would like to make their technology safe and easy to use. So. Um, even though some of the uh, systems may not, have, may not have been rated as well as they would have liked, uh, there is a general desire to try and make these systems safer. The problem is that they oftentimes don't, uh, they're released without full vetting. Um, and we also see that there's a tendency to try and put things that, it's my uh, opinion that uh, uh, things that are related to things like social media interactions just don't belong behind the wheel. And there's a greater tendency to try and put those things behind the, uh, in, at the fingertips of the driver. Um, so I think uh, um, the OEMs, the auto manufacturers, I think are interested in trying to make the technology so that it's safer. Uh, but right now there's kind of this assumption that if, if uh, your eyes are on the road and your hands are on the wheel, you're safe. And uh, that just is not uh, true. And, and you heard that both in my presentation and also in uh, Member Sunwald's uh, presentation. Yeah, hi, and it's Robert. I'd like to jump in on that too. You know, as David was speaking, uh, I thought people might wonder why has the NTSB not made a recommendation on the in-vehicle in information systems? And, uh, and the fact is, as Congress has, has told the NTSB, we are an accident investigation agency primarily. I mean, that's really our, our role in life. And so if we have not investigated an accident where, where, where something has been a factor, we're probably not going to have recommendations on this. So I don't want anyone to read into the, the fact that we do not have recommendations on the in-vehicle in information systems. I don't want you to read into that that we're tacitly saying phones are bad, but the IVS, I, I, IVIS is okay. Um, it's, it's hard to document the use of, um, of someone 
uh, using this technology if it's not done done right, and uh, and uh, various uh, police jurisdictions investigate accidents differently, and so uh, so we I'm personally very concerned about this uh, this technology in vehicles, and I'll say that the NTSB is 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 watching it very closely. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there was also several questions for Dr. Strayer about whether how your research assessed. Uh, GPS and other navigation devices. Yeah, we have, um, and we're still looking at that now. Uh, what I can say is that there are aspects of uh, navigation systems that are very supportive of the driver. The turn-by-turn -turn, uh, uh, navigation to get to your destination is far better than you know driving blind or trying to use a map uh, or getting lost. And so, there's no doubt about that. That part of it is very, very helpful. Um, less clear are the maps that also oftentimes come with the GPS. Uh, if they take your eyes off the road for more than two and a half seconds, we know that that increases the crash risk. Also, if you're going to be using some kind of point of, point of uh, uh, you know, destination entry kind of thing, if you, use those de if you enter the destination before you start driving, that is a much safer uh, way of interacting with that technology than trying to enter that destination and trying to talk with the system while you're on the road. That's a big source of visual and cognitive distraction to try and enter that uh, the POI destination information at the time. So if you use it and you use it in a way that's reasonable so that it's just delivering turn-by-turn -turn directions and you can keep your eyes on the road and you inter that interact with that technology and program it before you start driving, then it's a, a safety benefit. Thank you. Uh, there's also a couple questions on uh, liability and lawsuits um, and questions as to whether, whether those occur, are occurring. And yes, they are. And in the email we'll send to you, we'll include a link to our liability white paper. Um, that primarily includes cases where companies were sued while employees were using phones while driving and they crashed. There have also been civil cases, um, but our, our paper, paper doesn't, doesn't touch on that. But it, it will talk about employer liability and policies as a solution. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, I know there's, there's questions about laws, and I'm not sure if either of you want to speak to this, about you know, if the research is compelling, what, you know, what What's the future with passing state laws? I know many laws do actually prohibit teen drivers in most states from any cell phone use, including handheld and hands-free cell phone use. But currently, there's no state that bans uh, adult drivers from using hands-free. Um, so there's questions about what you know with NTSB's rule with recommending that. I know that has been a recommendation from you already. You're, you're exactly right. We do have uh, separate sets of recommendations for the uh, teen drivers as well, uh, which encompass the very things you were talking about there. Okay, thank you. Um, so, and I'm also, I got a few questions and for NTSB. Um, you know, there's, and you've probably heard this, there's a movement among um, advocates and, and public health folks to use the word crash instead of accident and what um, what is your your view of that well you can thank Debbie Hersman for that question uh, but uh, you know really uh, we, we uh, the NTSB uh, we refer to uh, to accidents, but we also recognize the sensitivity of the word crash, and it's helped to sensitize me to realize that uh, a lot of these things uh, uh, are not accidents; that there are reasons that they could be prevented, and and not not necessarily accidental. Uh, the our our statute does say that we uh, investigate accidents, uh, although again, what we realize that that term is uh, is maybe not best the best suited uh, one for for that. Uh, for that, but uh, we try to be very sensitive about that. Yeah, I know many. You know, many police crash reports. You know, they're they're using language that accidents because that has been the traditional word, and um, so there may be differences between our documentation and public communications. Um, 
So I think we're, we have one minute left for the call. We can see if there's a, there's a lot of more questions left in the queue that we weren't able to get to. We can see if we can answer them um, retroactively after the call via email. Um, we really appreciate everybody's time today for listening. And thank you, Member Sumwald and Dr. Strayer, for your time and all the information you shared. And we'll send you um, links to some of the um, resources that we talked about. We'll send you uh, uh, a policy kit to help reduce cell phone distracted driving in the workplace. We'll send you links to Distracted Driving Awareness Month materials. You'll get a copy of today's webinar's recording. And because Member Sumwalt mentioned the liability white paper, we'll send that to you as well in case anyone has questions on that. So again, thank you so much for joining us and expect to see an email from us soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.